Hello, and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's first virtual author talk. I'm Virginia Prescott, host of GPB's On Second Thought, and your host for this series. Tonight, I'm talking with Jennifer Steinhauer about her book, The Firsts, the inside story of the women reshaping Congress. There's the book. You can actually buy it. In fact, you can purchase it directly from the Acapella Books link in the chat box to the right of your screen, or use the link provided at the Atlanta History, Center, History Center's website. So as Jennifer and I are talking, we invite you to submit your questions using the Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to try and integrate them as much as possible and get to as many as time allows. Now to introduce Jennifer, Jennifer Steinhauer has covered a number of high profile beats in 25 years as a reporter for the New York Times, from the City Hall Bureau Chief and Los Angeles Bureau Chief to Capitol Hill. Among her accolades is a 2006 front page deadline award for her reporting on Hurricane Katrina. She's also author of a novel about the television business and two cookbooks. Jennifer Steinhauer, welcome. Thank you, so nice to be here. Well, we are indeed living in interesting times when talking con congressional politics is an escape from the news. So we're really happy to have you. But I have to ask, you spent a lot of time reporting on these women. You went to their home districts. Everybody okay, as far as you know? Um, so far, so good. I have not heard any terrible stories yet. There have been some members of Congress who've gotten sick, but um, so far, none of the women in my book. Glad to hear that. Well, let's talk about the book. You were there in January 2019 as 35 women, a record number, were sworn in as representatives to the 116th Congress. This is the most diverse group ever. Can you review for us some of the notable firsts among them? Yeah, so this had so many firsts, um, and some of them were in pairs. You had the first two um, Muslim women, the first two Native American women, you had the first two Latino women from the state of Texas, believe it or not. You had a lot of women, um, you had the youngest woman, the youngest person ever, and, the, and also we forget sometimes the oldest female freshman to ever serve, Donna Shalala, who'd already been a cabinet secretary. You had um, a lot of people who were the first woman for their district, the first person of color for their district. Um, you had some, some of them were multiple things like Lauren Underwood from the Chicago suburbs, a um, very Republican district, just a very, very majority white district. She's the first woman, the youngest person, and the first person of color to ever win that district. So you had a lot of different dynamics. But like so many other freshly minted representatives before them, they were fired up, they were ready to make a difference, but many had already set themselves apart by bucking some party norms. They challenged more senior Democrats to win their seats and defied other conventional campaign tactics. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, and I would put Donna Shalala in this category, by the way, that they didn't, she was not the party's pick. Um, they had other people in mind for that district that they thought uh, would, would possibly have a better chance of being the Republican. A lot of women, you know, um, as Lauren Underwood said to me, no one looked at me and said, girl, it's you. <laughs> she, nobody wanted her. You know, there were seven people, I think, in her primary, and she just fought through. So a lot of people who were not necessarily given such a great chance just, you know, push the limits. They use social media a lot. They did a lot of small donor um, campaigning, uh, kind of going against the, the organizations that support Democrats and really kind of going their own way. And really, um, it was very much, very much, and everyone says this, this, in this case, it was true, it was really, really super door to door, cornfield to cornfield, um, introducing themselves in some places these Democrats and all but one of the women who won House seats were Democrats that year, um, uh, you know, had been to districts where Democrats never even go. So, uh, you know, the Democratic idea was shore up the base, shore up the base. And they said, no, I, I need to do more than that. I need to convince new people to come my way. So that was just kind of against the party norms. And they carried some of those tools and that willpower and their biographies and their policy priorities into a very traditional institution where freshmen were pretty much expected to sit back and listen to senior members. So what are some of the ways we start to see those challenges to how things are done in the House? Well, of course, the most notable one was when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who had beaten an incumbent Democrat um, and to show up as the youngest person uh, ever in the House, which, by the way, um, people were amazed that she did that. But uh, Joe Crowley, who she beat, was everyone, a lot of people's friend, you know? So she's coming in, who's this person? She picked off my friend, you know? Um, and one of the first things she did was kind of suggest that other members 
um, other incumbents needed to have some primary challenges. So that right away was something that you hardly ever see and caused some friction. Um, but beyond having any conflict with their colleagues, a lot of them um, were kind of saying to leadership, to Nancy Pelosi, to the other leaders uh, who, you know, average age, you know, 78 years old, hey, we're the new blood. Um, we return the, the House to the Democrats. There's a lot of us. We're not your typical freshman. And we have a lot of varied backgrounds and professional experiences. We want to have more seat at the table. And Nancy Pelosi uh, smartly put a lot of them in as many positions of power as she could, whether it was giving them, you know, bills to sponsor or making them uh, chair women of subcommittees, which doesn't sound like a big thing out in the world, but in Washington, that's a big deal to try to you know, make sure that they, they had a sense of, of having some unusual power for freshmen. And there's a, a scene you write about where Ayanna Presley, she was rebuked in her first floor speech for maligning the president. So how does this, the sudden influence of social media start to change this because other people could see it, whereas normally it would, would have just been C-SPAN watchers. Yeah, Ayanna Presley has long referred to President Trump as the occupant of the White House. And she went down to the House for her floor speech uh, and said that. And um, she was reminded not to make personal remarks about the president. It was kind of a half-hearted rebuke, to be honest, because it was a Democrat in the chair. But, you know, she probably didn't even know that. Uh, you know, everyone arrives to Congress not knowing sort of the arcane rules and regulations and the way things work and the traditions, um, the dress codes, things like that. And people push back against those kind of things. I mean, Kristen Sinema in the Senate from Arizona, she decided she was going to go on the floor and she was going to, um, you know, uh, wear sleeveless dresses, which is not done on the Senate floor. But she went ahead and said she was going to do that. So they're already kind of just changing some of those traditional, traditional ways of the, of the institution. Well, you see the first exposed shoulders on the House floor, the first head scar, first babies. In many ways, they're calling attention to their differences by asking for these historic accommodations. How had that been handled in the past when women were suddenly in the House? Well, it's interesting um, that you frame it as an accommodation, which is an interesting way of looking at it. I think that um, for people in politics generally, and specifically for women, it's so long been the case that you kind of can't be your authentic self. You know, you have your game face, you have the, the, your political persona, if you will, how you behave on a campaign trail, how you dress, how you speak to people, how you have to be nice to children, even if you don't like children. And I think that these women, what it was is they were just embraced who they were, whether they were parents, you know, they, and they had to run off to a meeting from a meeting and call their kids. I know um, one member, Johanna Hayes, told me she will not take meetings at lunchtime because she does stuff with her kids at that time, um, FaceTimes with her kids back in Connecticut to do homework. And her, her staff said, well, that's not done that way. Well, that's how she was going to do it. Um, and you speak of the headscarf that um, Ilhan Omar got an accommodation to, to break the hat rules. You still can't wear hats on the floor, but you can wear religious headgear. So in recognition of, um, of those, of the diversity and, and, and the, um, just the, the female ways, if you will, I think it was just basically people speaking and saying, we're bringing our whole selves to Congress and to the workplace. People elected us because they like those, those people and we're not gonna change them just because we've gotten to this institution. I wanna just make sure my, everyone can hear me in my mic, if Carter can give me a sign up. Yeah, it looks like a little bit better. I've moved my mic. Well, we talked about some of the first, not the first tears uh, on the floor of the house, thanks to John Boehner, but women have long been advised against crying on the job since entering the workforce in, in big numbers. How have the shows of emotion gone over with their colleagues and with the public? Yeah, so I'm going to say that I still don't think you're ever going to see Nancy Pelosi cry on the floor. <laughs> And there have been some intense moments, you know, and even, even with deaths of colleagues and things like that. That's not the way she rolls. That's not how she kind of came through the system. She has a different um, background and reaction to things. Um, I think about, I saw a lot of crying in this Congress. Um, I think a lot about Rashida Tlaib from Detroit, a very fiery kind of emotional person. I saw her cry a lot. I saw women, I saw um, a floor speech where one woman talked about her partner's suicide um, early on in the Congress and was crying. I saw Katie Porter, who's, um, domestic violence passed, came up against her wishes during her campaign, but then she would go on to talk about the Violence Against Women Act 
and become choked up talking about how she almost had her kids taken away from her. And again, I think it's a, it's, um, it's a little different than um, how we used to think about women crying. Not that people don't think of women as overly emotional in politics. It still comes up all the time for men and women. But I think, again, when it was in service to, some, to their passion or it was in service um, to something about themselves that felt very real and very authentic, it felt a little different. I mean, John Boehner, he just like, he just lost it all the time. <laughs> and you know, everyone kind of came to accept that about him. Well, you share some somewhat comical stories of freshmen learning the ropes. Often the reporters like you know the scene much better, you know, the tunnels and the meeting rooms of the Capitol. But there's a much more uh, freighted story on the procedural learning curve. And this one is centering on the Georgia representative, Lucy McBath. You spoke with her, or maybe more accurately stalked her on the day that the, her bill to require universal background checks was due to come up on the House floor. Can you set that scene for us and tell us what happened? Yeah, I mean, um, this procedural matter, I'll try to not boring. Um, it's, it would normally be so. It became a real Achilles heel in this class, um, and it kind of showed, in a way, their differences and, and their newness, if you will. Um, so first of all, uh, Lucy McBath is an interesting character in this story because unlike a lot of freshmen, she was not unknown, um, especially you know, with the Congressional Black Caucus. She was very known because of her um, activism um, on, the, on the gun control issue. Uh, so she came to Congress with a reputation, with a background, with a, with a fan group. She was somebody um, who had her own, her own um, network, her own coalition, if you will. And Democrats for a long time have been wanting to pass this background check bill. She was obviously going to be the face of it um, and to push it through. And she was at a committee hearing. And I really, it, it felt to me, um, everything always feels like you really need to do it when you're a reporter. And then I don't know if you need to do it. But in that situation, I, I felt that I had to see her pass literally to the floor with her son's photo. Um, to go to have that bill passed. And I kind of chased her around the Capitol. She really didn't want to talk at that time, but I just wanted to be with her. So I did kind of stalk her. And we were in a members only elevator at one point and she thanked other people for their support of that bill. Um, so there's this funny thing in the house where, you know, the majority of bills about to come to the floor the minorities probably pretty much all of them are gonna vote against it or a lot of them. And the minority has an opportunity to do something called a motion to recommit. They get to spring some little amendment to a bill. No one's seen it before. It's not gone through the normal legislative process. They pop it out there. They say it's always some kind of really um, over the top thing like this motion keeps people from uh, letting child rapists and super, you know, something just really over the top. That the reason, the notion of it is if you vote against it, then they'll use that to say, oh, can you believe Jennifer vote against it, this child rapist thing? It's the idea, to, it's a gotcha thing. And experienced members know to ignore it. You vote against it. It's, it's just something that's just like, kind of like a delay tactic before the bill is actually passed. No one ever passes them. Well, some of these women started, um, and some men too, started to vote for these measures because they didn't really understand that it was a tactic and they didn't want to get tarred with not voting for these things. And there was um, an amendment that was attached to that that had to do with ICE, um, and which was very, and, and gun ownership and, and, and immigrants illegal immigrants. And on paper, it sounded, you know, kind of a reasonable thing, but it was really just to kind of, you know, just to stick it to the Democrats. And at that time, we were, it was emerging the whole issue of child separation, the child separation policy from families. Immigration was becoming an extremely heated issue as it, you know, kind of ebbs and flows through Congress. It was a hot time on that. And you had, especially the Progressive Caucus, get very upset because that measure passed with the help of Democrats. Mm -hmm. And then they were stuck sort of having to wonder if they were going to vote for Lucy McBath's bill and therefore have that go along with it. It was kind of irrelevant because the Senate was never going to take up her bill anyway. It's controlled by Republicans. They were never going to take up the background check bill. But it became a real emotional moment on the floor where the progressives yelling at the moderates, the moderates saying, well, we agreed with that piece of thing. And it, you know, everyone walked off the floor and Lucy McBath was greeted by all the gun safety folks and they were so happy and she was happy and she felt like it was her day, but it was her day with an asterisk. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of battles on the floor last year. 
Well, so this is one of the tactics that obviously they weren't prepared for, but there was a bit of a reprimand. I think you write about uh, from uh, Speaker Pelosi, you know, you got to hang together. If you have power, you have to, you have to keep it. Right. And this is, this is one of the things, the wedges between progressives and moderates that you saw in that case. But this has been the driving story of the 2020 Democratic primary, presidential primary. Just today, Elizabeth Warren became the latest former candidate to endorse Joe Biden for president. Biden now presumptive nominee after progressive Bernie Sanders out. So what does this tension mean for the dynamics in the House and with the firsts? So with the Democrats who beat Democratic incumbents and who are the more progressive wing, I, you know, obviously led by AOC. I mean, she was Bernie Sanders' biggest surrogate to me. With him exiting the stage, in my mind, she is the leader of the progressive wing of the party um, and its future. And um, they gave life to the progressives that are already in the House that were kind of on the margins, right? And then you had all these um, so-called moderates. And I, I always like to use that word loosely because Lucy McBath, it probably many people would not call her a moderate, but she is vis-a-vis -vis a lot of people that are in that that section of the party. You know, it just depends on where you live and what, what it means to be moderate. But just for the sake of this conversation, there are people who beat Republicans. Mm -hmm. And they understand that their district isn't made up primarily of Democrats or majority of Democrats. Um, and so they want to stay, in keeping your power, they want to stay in office too. And so this tension was always between, do you move the party to the left um, and and make that be the, sort of the party that everyone kind of they sort of dreams of? Or do you stick more to the middle and make sure that people who beat Republicans can uh, hew there and, and stay and get uh, reelected? It's just the way people running for the White House want to be able to pull in independents, Republicans, the first time, you know, Trump voters. They need a broad coalition, you need a broad coalition to win elections. And when you're on the far left or the far right of your party, it's hard to bring in a big, a big coalition to win. And that's, look, that the Republicans had their own battle with that, um, with the Tea Party wave in, in 2010, when they took over the House, they had the same internal battle. And we see where they are. They ultimately became, um, I think, without any argument, if for now, the party of Donald Trump, that's the decision they made. That's where they landed. Um, and Democrats now are, are in that struggle. And I think we've kind of seen where they are in this moment in time. But that struggle is going to continue. It's continued to this day. You mentioned Elizabeth Warren, you know, um, uh, Biden's trying to get AOC's endorsement. And she's been asking for all these different, you know, concessions on climate and health care. They're trying to really push the party. And that's going to continue. Well, the squad have certainly been influential. And Lauren asked, why have only the four women in the squad gotten so much public attention? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because, um, I mean, AOC originally got so much attention because no one heard of her and she won this race and she was um, this very telegenic, outspoken person who really had this social media following and became this big political following that people really hadn't seen before. And people were paying so much attention to her and Democrats didn't want to run afoul of her because they didn't want her to go on Twitter and say something mean about her. And she had all this very big political influence. I wouldn't say legislative influence, but political influence. And then I think a lot of the reason that they got attention, frankly, is because they came in the crosshairs of the president and they were sparring with him and he was identifying them as um, the symbols, if you will, of the far left, um, you know, as they defined it, socialists, um, and tried to kind of make them the face of the Democratic Party. So in my personal view, um, the true squad, if you want to use that, is actually a different group of women who beat Republicans. Um, these women are uh, veterans and national security background um, women. Um, I think of my Mikey Sherrill from New Jersey. You have Elaine Luria, who's the Navy from Virginia. Abigail Spamberger, who was a CIA operative. Also, she's from Central Virginia. Um, Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan. Chrissy Houlihan from Pennsylvania. They all had this national security background and veteran background. And they knew each other before the campaign, unlike the squad. They didn't really know each other at all. They kind of got, you know, came, came together in during orientation. These women campaigned together. They got a lot of the same fundraising um, monies together and did events together. They had this group text. They're always kind of planning legislation together. They do more, they, they vote much more together. The squad is not cohesive legislatively. They kind of go their own way. 
they have their own constituencies, they have their own political situations going on, their own ambitions, and it's it's a little it's a little overstated how much they actually hang together. Um, where that other group, uh, they really, in my view, do. Well, I want to ask you more about the the badasses. That's what they call themselves. These five women with national security credentials, CIA, former CIA ops officers, for example after the squad spending a lot of time trying to ratchet up pressure to impeach President Trump, this is especially after the Mueller report over the summer, the badass has actually played a really influential role in moving Speaker Pelosi forward on impeachment. So, so what did they do? So again, in that classic tension, the more liberal end of the party really wanted to impeach the president from day one, literally, you know, this came up during uh, the day after they were sworn in, um, uh, they, Rashida Tlaib infamously talked about impeaching the president, kind of in, you know, sort of almost sort of overshadowed everything else that went on that day. And people who won these districts were, you know, quite frankly, a lot of them when they were campaigning didn't even talk about President Trump, forget about impeachment, they didn't even mention his name, because that was not going to necessarily be a popular message. They talked about health care, they talked about other issues. And so, um, they were not eager to do that. That was not going to be popular in their districts, but they concluded, I go back to the text group, and by the way, there are some male veteran freshmen who were in that group too. Um, they kind of came together, not every single one of them, but most of them, and, and they were group texting, and they were talking about, this is really different, this Ukraine call. This is different than everything else we've heard. Mueller report, forget it. This is something from a national security standpoint, from our background standpoint, that cannot stand. And they wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post that they shared with Nancy Pelosi before it was published. And that was very influential, not just on her, it was very influential on their colleagues. Because now here are some people from Republican districts who've been very resistant to the impeachment message, who on, a ba on the basis of national security credentials were advocating for this. And history will show, you know, whether that was a wise choice or not to go forward, but they certainly played a pivotal role. Well, you mentioned that uh, Speaker Pelosi met with the newcomers, all of the first, when they were, and put them in important positions on committees. But what was the ongoing relationship with her, between her and these new young women who were in her, her coalition? I think that um, Nancy Pelosi is very experienced in dealing with a broad range of Democrats, because that's what, that, that's what that, that uh, caucus looks like. Um, and it always has. And she's always gotten credit for skillfully bringing them all together. And I think that um, in some ways, she kind of didn't know what to do with this headstrong group of freshmen. And sometimes she would get frustrated with them. And I think some of it was not so much um, that they were so much in the attention. And she would you know, slap them down. I mean, when, the, when AOC rolled out the Green New Deal, she called that, oh, the, the Green New something, what is that? I mean, she made it very clear, she signaled. Um, what she was going to take interest in and what she was not. But in some ways, I feel like the frustration was more that she saw their power and it wasn't that she didn't like their political power, it's that she wanted them to use it differently. And I really felt that way when she went on a trip shortly after a big flap with Ilhan Omar over um, his perceived anti-Semitic remarks and a lot of faulty raw that came out of that. They had gone on a long tr planned trip with some members of the um, Congressional Black Caucus to Africa. And I noticed that Nancy Pelosi made sure photos came out of them sitting together and we all knew they were on a plane together and standing together. And I think she was trying to signal to Ilhan Omar and others, this is how you use your power and this is how you influence people and this is how you, you, you build a, a broader coalition and don't isolate, don't go outside, stay inside the tent. And I did notice that AOC barely has endorsed any challengers um, to the left of her colleagues this cycle. And I thought, I'm, I think that's, I note that with interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. You know, Democrats, of course, banking on the future of the party as, as a multicultural coalition of getting black and brown and working class voters all in under their tent. This has been reinforced, of course, in the rhetoric and policy pushes from the squad and others. But you point out that some of those, like AOC, the superstar, won in whiter and richer parts of her district. And since the book, we've seen routing of a number of justice Democrats, as they're called in primaries, suggesting that voters may not agree. So I'm wondering what the message is there from voters. Well, I mean, I think the message was given pretty loud and clear with the, um, at the time, somewhat surprising and then absolutely um, definitive routing that Joe Biden did. I mean, uh, you there are individual districts that are very democratic 
Um, and, and by the way, you know, uh, demographics drive this too, youth a lot. And perhaps that's the future of the party um, to be pretty far to the left. But I think that we're seeing where the broadest coalition of the party is now, whether it's older voters, older, especially older African-American voters who are the ba huge part of the base, we see that um, that message is not, uh, is not as popular as the so-called more moderate message. But, you know, I always like to say this, and I say this to, to kids a lot who are really um, on the left who are very frustrated, and they laugh at me, but I mean it. I say every single Democrat who was on that stage in the beginning, and I would include Joe Biden in this pretty much, are to the left of Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And the idea, everybody um, on the left wants Medicare for all, I get it. And they think that um, single payer is like this, this squish position. Well, that was um, considered very far left when I first got to Washington and people lost their seats over that. So people kind of forget sometimes the party's policy objectives um, have moved quite a bit to the left in many ways over the last decade but they're not necessarily where AOC is as a broadly as a party in our country. Well, let's talk about where they are. Uh, although AOC and others getting a lot of attention, uh, you pointed out earlier, her record on measures in Congress may not be great. I think in the book you say it may be even inverse of her numbers on social media, but she and Katie Porter and others have emerged as extremely effective in House committee hearings. But what is the actual legislative record of the first on health care and economic inequality, climate change, some of the things that they ran on? Well, you know, of course, it's always hard to measure legislative success in divided government because a lot of the really big ticket stuff doesn't get even taken up by the Senate um, when you have divided government, in this case, Republican control. But you know, Democrats, these Democrats, I look at, I went to talk to you about Lauren Underwood, she was um, a nurse and she's been very focused on healthcare. She ran her whole campaign on that. And I think she got a lot of um, amendments and, and bills, for example, passed um, in, in the House. Um, Katie Porter has also been very effective. Um, I talk about, I talk about Den Holland, you know, we don't talk as much about the two Native American women and they're quite different from each other. They're a different uh, age cohort. They're different districts. Den Holland's a pretty liberal district in New Mexico. Sharice David's beat a Republican and it's been a historically Republican district in Kansas City. Uh, Kansas was the suburbs there. And, but they've been very effective in doing legislation that benefits Native American women, especially Den Holland. That's been a real focus of hers. So, I think that you see uh, both different interest, legislative interests because of the diversity, and you do see um, a lot of these women doing a lot of things you may not hear about because they're tucked into bills that were signed, you know, bigger bills that were signed into law or they never saw the light of day in the Senate. But they definitely, you, you alluded to the hearings, they've definitely been a name for themselves, challenging witnesses. Um, Katie Porter, especially with, as, a, as a law professor, I mean, she just makes mince me out of people on a pretty weekly basis. I was actually reading in Ms. McSweeney's, they did an article as if they were Katie Porter's whiteboard, you know, going in to slay the next person, yeah. which was quite funny. But people like Katie Porter, largely conservative district, quite a name for herself in the house with her whiteboard. Um, yeah. Abigail Spanberger, these are, these are people who, women who likely benefited from waning support for Trump in the suburbs or in general and picked off seats by moderates and Republicans. What about the prospects for 2020? Is this a response to the Trump election, which motivated many of them. And will that last? Like you mentioned the Tea Party earlier. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I get asked this a lot, of course. Um, and I always say it's hard to imagine that every uh, person who won a seat in the, in the House, men and women, will be back um, in 2020 because some of them won some really tough districts. Um, but, you know, 2018 was two things. It was a bit of a referendum on Trump, again, especially with women in the suburbs. And it was really, really a referendum on House Republicans and their attempts to undo the Affordable Care Act. That was just an unpopular thing to do. Um, once people had, you know, people didn't like that bill a lot across the country in theory, but once they had it, once they had that insurance, it's hard to take it away from people. Um, and that was very unpopular and a lot of them ran exclusively on that. And we're kind of gearing up to talk about healthcare and drug pricing and things this go around. I think now with the with the COVID-19 um, situation, no matter where we are in November, that completely colors the entire race, but in the same framework. It's, a, it's going to 
further expose issues about our healthcare system. Um, I mean, you wait and see what happens to these hospitals, these medical practices, and people getting their big ventilator bills and all these things, we're gonna to start to see our healthcare system respond. Uh, right now we're in the emergency response. We're gonna see the bigger long-term uh, implications for our individual health and for the health of our system. And Donald Trump's response to that will continue to be uh, framing him politically. Um, as, you know, as a referendum on him. So it's really, it's just a continuation on this just very extreme scale of those themes. Well, of course, all of these women were present. The first were present in the bipartisan passage of stimulus and relief bills. Uh, Katie Porter, again, uh, the congressional hearing in early March, she got commitments from officials and the head of the CDC to pay for COVID-19 testing for Americans, regardless of insurance. So it has really emerged as a voice, but. He, she also said to you, Congress is not made for people like me. Um, and you go through a day in the life of Katie Porter. It is really challenging, especially for someone on the West Coast. This is a mother, single mother of three kids. How does she manage? And how do others manage? Well, she manages with some difficulty. <laughs> I think she's like on the phone a lot in the grocery store. Um, and she has a Manny, as she says, back home in California, who's kind of running things. And she's also, that's not even a one airplane trip because she's in Orange County. So it's difficult to get to. Um, time difference, obviously, is a challenge for her, all of that. And, um, you know, when you go back home, we know the term recess and everyone kind of assumes people go back to their district when Congress is in session and get a pedicure or something. It's not how it is. I mean, you're running from one thing to the next when you're back home, you're running all the time when you're in Congress. These are hard jobs and your time is not your own. And that's doubly hard with people, um, as all working parents know, with kids at home. And um, she's just kind of, she just didn't know she could make it work. I mean, when she was gonna run, she said, how am I gonna pull this off? And she probably still wonders how she's gonna pull it off, but she seems to be pulling it off. <laughs> Well, 2018 was not a banner year for Republican women who actually lost 10 seats, if I'm remembering correctly. But it's not just this year, but as you look over the last decade, some structural challenges for Republican women. Why so difficult for them to get momentum? Well, they struggle a lot in primaries. That's their biggest problem. Because when women get through primaries, they win uh, in any party at the same rate as men. And Republican women have a hard time getting through primaries. Um, it, it's, you know, this isn't the history of the party. Uh, the first Republican woman, Jeanette Rankin, um, who won, you know, two years before we even had the federal right to vote, was a Republican. And all the early years in Congress, when we, all those early years when women were just, you know, one, one, two, three, two, you know, was pretty evenly Republican Democrat until you got into the 70s and, and Democrats started to run uh, more often on their own uh, because a lot of the seats early on too were women taking their dead husband seats. Uh, in both parties. So when women started to really come into their own and run, decided to run on their own, both parties did that, but there were more Democrats. So that was one thing. But you know, the Republican Party really did, it used to invest a lot in women, um, just like Democrats do big time now. They have a huge fundraising apparatus for it. And the philosophy of the party shifted in the sense that um, as the party became more conservative and, and sort of the New Gingrich era, um, and the Republican Women's Caucus started to become, it was very bipartisan, started to fracture more along party lines. Uh, the party kind of made the decision that you know, we, we, don't, we don't do gender or, or um, any other kind of preference. It's all about the best person, the best person. I think they're starting to rethink that, um, watching what happened in 2018 with Democratic women. They're starting to realize if you want women from your party in office, and, and they do, especially Republican women, then you have to make a really conscious and intentional effort to elect women, whether it's fun recruiting, fundraising, validating, getting men to validate them in more conservative districts. I'd had one woman who uh, lost in North Carolina in a special election primary. She thought she was a great candidate, a pediatrician. She really thought she was Joan Perry. She, everyone thought she was just gonna be, uh, had it made. And she told me later that she was shocked to see polls that said basically men and women over 50 didn't want to vote uh, in, in Republican primary, didn't want to vote for women. And she said, I said, how do you think you could have done better with that? And she said, I would have been helpful if I had more men campaign with me. So it's, it's you have to speak to people where they're at and, and really be intentional about it. Yeah, that's one of the things that becomes clear. Not, you know, districts are different. Uh, every single district is different and the constituents that send people are different. 
But there's this you know, wave of women getting elected in the House and the Senate, yet one major candidate in this historic field of nine female candidates for president made it much past Super Tuesday, too, if you count Tulsi Gabbard. Now, I know down ticket and president, presidential elections are different, but I'm curious to know what you think about that. The perception, the CNN poll in 2020, only 15% of voters thought women could be president. What's the disconnect here? I'm not really sure. You know, I always, I, I still, and it's a little bit, I, I guess I'm counter, counterintuitive about this, but if you go back to Hillary Clinton, um, there was a lot of feeling that sexism played a big role in her loss. And no doubt sexism is a huge part in American politics. But Hillary Clinton brought her own troubles to that table, right? She had a long history. People knew her really well. They had long established feelings about that her. Some of them, again, rooted in sexist feelings. But there were all kinds of things going on there. So I didn't take her as the symbol of women, right? So then next we moved to Elizabeth Warren. And I think there was a lot more hope for, um, for her. And she kind of took off quite well in the beginning. And I think that we are not, we haven't had the distance from that campaign to unpack it, but I think when we do, we will start to see, did sex and play, play a role? Yes. But was that a really broad field with people from all points of points on the spectrum? Did Elizabeth Warren do herself any favors with her kind of back and forth thing on Medicare for all? Um, you know, there were things that were specific to her and specific to that campaign that I think that in retrospect, we'll see. Um, don't indicate that women can't get elected. Having said that to, to, the, to the presidency, having said that, given this, the many, many, many other nations in the world that have had female presidents, it is enormously frustrating, I think, um, for women in this country to have still not hit, hit, broken through that ceiling. Uh, Liz asked the question that I think is underlying the book. A yeah, hundred years after women won the right to vote, Having spent so much time with these women, what do you think we can expect their influence to be on the institution as their terms continue and they learn more about how Congress works or doesn't? So I kind of became convinced that in order for us to see something that we can point to and say that's the influence of women, you have to just have more of them. And I kind of say that because I watched the Nevada legislature become very slightly majority women. And they did a whole lot of legislation that really, I think, reflected that um, state funding for rape test kits, all kinds of things like that right out of the out of the box. I think that women change the institution in ways that are meaningful for them, like having a bathroom near the, the vote, you know, the floor where they vote, having now they have changing rooms in all of the, um, the bathrooms now. They have all these different ways that it finally reflects the reality of women being there. But right now, I think the most powerful thing that women do in, in this number, even though it's still less than 25%, that they do, and I really mean this, and I, and I don't mean this just because I think this in my heart. I, I observed this when I was reporting the book on the Hill and out in the districts, is that when young women look out to the floor and they see all these women, young women, women who look like them, women who come from backgrounds like them, women who went to community colleges, you know, women of all different, uh, different backgrounds, and Sharice Davids goes to, uh, as I did with her in Kansas City, um, a housing project uh, with very, very, very low household income with a bunch of 15-year-old high school students and talk to them and they look at her. I can see in their eyes the sense of possibility of what their future could be. It's just incredibly influential on the next, uh, the next generation of, of women and on being told that they can be making, understanding that they can run, which, you know, for so long, women really just didn't think about themselves. Men look in the mirror and they see, uh, they see a house member, <laughs> they see a president. Women often have to be asked over and over and over again to run. That was even true with some people in this class. And I just think that's gonna change. Jennifer, you write about a scene, it's a climactic scene at the border where uh, members of the squad and other representatives have gone to see what is going on, the migrant crisis, you know, the. Uh, separating children from their parents. And it is a stark vision of different beliefs in our society. But there's also, you write about, and I'd love it if you would read this for us, if you don't mind, about how different most Americans feel, or many Americans feel about the prospects of unity and, and those who are in Congress and those who have opinions who are there protesting 
for the same kind of thing. Yeah, so this observation, I think that you're referring to here on page 154, um, has come out of uh, this press conference that um, members of the squad, I don't think Ilhan Omar was there, but the rest of them were, they were in Veronica Escobar's district. Veronica Escobar is uh, one of the new members. She took Beto O'Rourke's seat at the Texas border, and this was in the, the heat of the family separation moment, and, you know, a lot of members of Congress were coming down to inspect the conditions and see what was going on in these detention facilities and really bad reports of people drinking out of toilets and so forth and the very upsetting uh, conditions in this very hot desert. And they have a press conference to discuss what they've seen. And they're surrounded by protesters here in the southern you know, border of Texas in Veronica's district. <laughs> now, these are people who've elected her in local office for years, you know, um, and their signs go home and stop crying and this huge conflagration uh, with women, the women speaking back to them. Um, Ayanna Presley saying, you know, racist words for racist acts. And it was this incredibly um, uh, cataclysmic confrontation, if you will. And um, I talk about how there's sort of this two different Americas that seem on display there, right? This new kind of like pluralistic uh, diverse America and then there's people who kind of uh, surrounded by people who really want to go back to a different kind of America. Um, you know, America first, the kind of notion that President Trump has promulgated. And uh, after observing that, I, I wrote, yet for so many millions of Americans, the world does not feel so starkly rendered. Many people outside the Beltway and political Twitter live lives defined by prosaic decisions. Mow the lawn or watch Netflix. Brave the traffic or use public transportation. Pay their medical bills or buy some groceries. Yoga or Orange Theory. Onion rings or French fries. Their dealings with members of Congress are rare and generally to be avoided, as such an interaction would likely signal they have a problem uh, with their social security check or a shakedown for a campaign donation. The left and the right have taken turns over generations shouting, where's the outrage, and demanding that someone return their country to them but we are all the sum product of a nation that has been both taken from us and renewed. Just as 20 years before President Obama's election, the presidency would have been his presidency would have been unimaginable. Five years before Trump's, his presidency perhaps even more so. Both of these um, resulted from the collective choice of American citizens, however divided and driven in part by the whimsical choices of a narrow swath of voters who chose to show up on election day. But the scene that day in Clint, Texas, made the choice feel more stark, not one between political parties or theories or philosophies, but rather the core of our nation's identity. Jennifer Steinhauer there reading from the first, the inside story of the women reshaping Congress. Want to invite you, if you have any questions, to enter it in the Q&A feature on your screen. Uh, while I just wrap this up, I would love to open it up to more questions if we have them. But so you've painted this picture of the process. And in many ways, I read this book and see you as a reporter watching these conversations go on and the process of democracy, uh, the sausage being made, if you will, in Congress. But in many ways, there's also a, a kind of beauty and respect that you have for the institution and the way that things get debated. I'm just wondering if you have any reflections on that as a long-term reporter and somebody who sees this kind of where's the outrage play over and over again in cycles. Well, it's funny you say sausage because I think you you see there's a scene in my book where Nancy Pelosi's kind of getting mad at her caucus and saying, you know, you got to come together, you got to get it together here. You know, you, a lot of you people came here to make faux gras, but most of the days we're just making sausage. And I thought that was obviously very... Um, um, apt analogy. Yeah, I um, uh, I believe um, in in the legislative process. I believe in the in having you know, separate branches of government. I believe that's important. I believe that's important for our democracy. And we focus so much in Washington and the country on the White House. But you know, the Congress is kind of you know that's the the yay or nay spot of of policy, um, prescriptive policy in our country in, in, in any direction. Um, and that process comes together in a way that you don't see on cable and you don't see on Twitter and you don't see um, in political ads, which is through not very sexy, not very uh, uh, um, exciting um, business of committee work and writing bills and having hearings and having discussions. And, you know, the dirty secret about Congress is most of these people get along pretty well. 
behind the scenes. They have to. They sit in committees together. They sit there. I see them in elevators together. I said, Republicans make fun of AOC. Boy, they'll chase her down a hallway to say hello to her. They're fascinated with her. I mean, a little less so now that time has gone by, but they were just so interested in meeting her. So these, these, um, these people get along better on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's all kinds of stuff that they work together on. It's just kind of not stuff that you read about in the news. And that's the thing people really don't see. Um, but that's the important part. And that's how our democracy, you know, does seem to manage to survive. Well, Jennifer Steinhauer, I want to thank you so much for joining us for our inaugural virtual author event. Really appreciate it. It was so great to be here. Thank you so much. And thank you. Um, thank you to uh, the History Center and Acapella Bookstore for sponsoring this. It's wonderful to be here. And I hope you have many, many successful events. Thank you. Here's the book. Again, the first, you can buy it on the chat link into your, the right of your screen. Um, Jennifer has also written some wonderful obituaries for the Times, Those We've Lost series. I highly encourage you to look those up. You can follow her at Jess Tay. How do you say it, Jess Tay? What, what do you say? J-E-S-T-E-I on yeah. Twitter. It's a better way to do it. And thank you for tuning in tonight. We are going to be broadcasting portions of this on On Second Thought on GPB next Friday. And you can join us on Tuesday evening, that's April 21st, for another virtual author event with Julia Alvarez, which is really quite great. She's discussing her first adult novel in 15 years. It's called Afterlife, also at 7. Suman Kid is coming up later. You can see a full schedule and the Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. I want to thank everybody at the Atlanta History Center for putting this together. And again, Jennifer Steinhauer, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.